That's not terrifying at all. Okay, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Is it on? It's on. Yeah, no. <laughs> You are a boomer. Apparently, oh, I'm a boomer. So yeah, you're a more you're boomer. A boomer. You're a, also a bit. You haven't been called a biscuit girl in a while. I guess it's because true. I, well, it's because I it's been that junior, but yeah. I feel like it's over. Is visco done? Is visco dead? Is visco done? The, okay. Comment down the bottom if visco <laughs> is dead. Is dead. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next dot point is actually sub dot point. Sub dot point. Mm. Um, I actually break it into a sub sub dot point. Because the sub dot point is geomorphic and hydrologic processes. Mm. And that's two of our biophysical interactions. Geomorphic being lithosphere. Lithosphere, shout out lithosphere. Hydrologic being hydrosphere. So I break them oh. up. So when you go into... Oh, hydrosphere? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was bad. Uh, so if you're about your talk, you're looking at your book, you'll see them as separate dot points. Just because I think it's easier to break them up. So today we're just doing geomorphic. Geomorphic processes. Yep. So we're focusing on the lithosphere. Lithosphere, I love lithosphere. Now lithosphere, you think, well, that's more on the land stuff, like you know the volcanoes and the earthquakes and all that sort of stuff. Has an impact on the reef too. Um, there's two, there's two main ways that the uh, lithosphere has an impact on the Barrier Reef, and in terms of its formation, it has been important. Um, so the two ways we look at is earth movements mm -hmm. and then working in erosion. Before we get to that, though, I just want to go back one more step it's geomorphic processes so just to what this word geomorphic, oh, geomorphic means yeah. and geomorphology so geomorphology what's is actually one of the best subjects so i yeah. if what you is, go what, to, is, what does geo mean um earth oh. hmm. what, what does morph mean to change oh like the cow ranges the earth um so if you go to university and you do geography physical geography or geology which was my two majors um each year of your degree so um, at least three courses, you will do geomorphology. Um, it's, and it's all about how is our physical world shaped and how does it change through weathering, erosion, plate tectonics, um, all of our landforms we have, why do they look the way that they look? Um, and you'll do this as like an introduction to geomorphology I and mean, it'll get more and more advanced as you go. So it's a huge, you know, section of geography at a tertiary level for those people who are considering going on. Mm -hmm. um, They're really, really interesting. Yeah, it's the, cool, the, I love it. The Earth's dynamic system stuff in terms of lithosphere is just super interesting. I love it. And it's so much more than what we do at high school. Like when we're talking about before our favourite spheres, and I said atmosphere, and Sir said lithosphere. I love studying geomorphology, but we don't do it too much at a high school level. So if this is like something that interests you, there's it's like a whole other subject that you haven't even had a chance to experience at university level. So I highly advise physical geography at university. Okay. Earth movements. Yeah, so essentially, uh, as Sammy said, there's uh, two main categories of um, these these things. Uh, the, the first is essentially this plate tectonics, earth movement stuff is how stuff gets built up, and the weathering and erosion stuff is how it's fallen away, and utilization of forces and stuff like that. But um, in earth movements, you've got two um, subcategories for earth movements. The first, I'll start with the, in terms of the, the syllabus, the second, the second one, but um, the first is continental drift. We talked about continental drift in our. Um, uh, intro video and essentially the uh, Australian continent has been drifting north since snapping off Antarctica. It was 150 million years ago. 160 million years ago. Um, so we've been drifting further and further northwards into warmer and warmer waters. So Australia had to drift a uh, significant amount of the distance before it could get into a warm enough zone of the ocean for coral to grow in the first place. So one of the reasons the reef exists is because of the continental drift northwards of the continent. Um, but there is also, um, so that's sort of Think of that as like lateral movement across the Earth's surface from so, south to north. Yeah, so 20 million years ago we drifted into water that was warm enough to yeah. actually support a coral reef yeah. system. Yeah. Um, the Great Barrier Reef as we know it is yeah. about 10,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. Because um, like the, over those 20 million years of time, um, there has been multiple ice ages and interglacial periods and stuff like that. So the sea levels increase and decrease and decrease and decrease. So um, if you have uh, an ice age where you have a lot of water frozen at the poles, sea level drops, and if it drops far enough, then it drops all the way out to essentially the continental shelf. So therefore, Australia, off the coast of Australia, would go very deep and very quickly, and there wouldn't really be any place for a reef to be. Um, when sea level, when uh, uh, sea levels drop, sea levels drop. Um, no, no, when sea levels rise again. Oh yeah. 
uh, because the ice is melting. Yeah. Um, that leaves a lot of the continental shelf covered by water and a lot of the space for reefs to grow. So there's over the last 20 years, there's been a cycle of like reefs, no reefs, reefs, no reefs, no reefs, no reefs, no reefs, as the oceans increase and decrease. And, um, and when we go from like no reef back to reef, the reef back, so say we had a reef and then we go to no reef and then we get another reef, it actually builds on top of the mm. reef that was already there. Yeah. So, um, we've got these series of reefs that have all been built up on top of each other. Yeah. But we really can't stress enough the importance of continental drift. Yeah. If our continents were stationary, no. yeah, we wouldn't. We wouldn't we, I mean, Australia would be completely different to where it is, to what it is today, but we definitely would not have um, a coral reef ecosystem. Yeah. Cool, so that's ladder removal. The other one, and it's, uh, subsistence is the second point. Um, this is not usually, it's often neglected and sometimes not even discussed, but um, continental, uh, continental movement or movement of the, the plates, the tectonic plates, doesn't just happen laterally, as in Australia flows north to south. Um, continents can go up and down as well. Right? Yeah, there's, there's lift and there's, what's the opposite to lift? Subsistence. Subsistence. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes up and goes down. It lifts, yeah. Um, it, it, it's thrust up upwards lift. and yeah, up, lift, up lift and subsistence. So um, the uh, ocean depth has a very, very, as we've just discussed in our last two videos, if you've recently watched them, um, the coral grows at essentially between four meters and 30 meters of depth. Um, that's the ideal for light penetration through the water. So if there is subsistence and the sort of continent is shrinking and therefore the ocean, the, the, the ocean is getting deeper, that has an impact on how coral can grow. And if it's uplifted out of the water entirely or even up to about anything shallower than four meters, you really can't get much coral growing there either because there's too much light. Yeah, and as we pack more and more sediment and more and more reef onto an area of continent, it's going to subside. It's going to be pushed down heavier yeah. and heavier. Yeah. Um, this hasn't happened to a point where, you know, areas of coral have died off, mm -hmm. um, but it is something to consider. The thing that would have a huge difference is if there was uplift. Yeah. This uh, wouldn't happen because we are in the middle of a tectonic plate in Australia, but other coral reefs, if there was movement between their plate tectonics and an area was uplifted, mm -hmm. it could um, uplift basically that coral reef completely out of the mm -hmm. water altogether um, and it would die. Um, not that it was a coral reef, this happened in New Zealand um, in like 2015, I think it was, it was a large earthquake. Now, obviously, New Zealand doesn't have reefs, but um, has a lot of you know, sea life off the coast, seaweed and, and stuff like that. So one section on, on the South Island, there was a big earthquake and a whole bunch of the sea floors went straight up out of the ocean. And you had this big section, there's pictures of it available on Google, um, and all this essentially seaweed and you know, um, rocks and stuff that were just the sea floor mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago, were now like a meter out of the, out of the yeah. um, ocean. And again, yeah. if you go to university and do physical geography and you do geomorphology, there's really interesting examples all over the world where you've had these convergent plate boundaries that have pushed land up and you can find like fossils from the ocean on top of these large hills and large mountains mm -hmm. because of the way the plate tectonics have moved. Yeah, so really interesting. very interesting and really good uh, evidence for continental drift. Yes, very good. It's not just a movie, it's a thing that's real. It's a movie? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ice Age 2. Ah, oh, I can see 2. Okay. The next one we do is weathering and erosion. Mm, yeah, they yeah. are different, but they work together. And at the Great Barrier Reef, whenever there's weathering, there's going to be erosion. So weathering is simply when we break down a rock. So we get little little bits of the sediment come off the rock, or maybe a big rock smashes into a rock and breaks it in half. That's weathering. As soon as that sediment that's been broken off, that rock that's been broken off, is moved away from its source through wind or water or glaciers, definitely not in this case, but in other cases, that's erosion. Because we're working in an aquatic ecosystem, anything that is weathered, any sediment that is weathered, is going to be moved by water straight away. Mm -hmm. So we, in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, weather and erosion work hand in hand. Yeah, and it's got um, wave action, it's also got tidal action there. It's two, yes. two major ways that the uh, ocean moves stuff around. Which we'll look at that in the hydrosphere when we get to our next video. Indeed. Um, yeah. Uh, chemical and mechanical. We've got two types of weathering that mainly occur, our chemical weathering and our mechanical weathering. Mechanical weathering is when we physically break a rock with another rock. So a big rock gets broken off by a wave, it smashes into another rock, it's a bommy. Mm -hmm. It smashes into another rock and then that rock gets broken up. Yeah. So that's mechanical weathering. Yep. Um, and uh, what chemical, weathering? chemical weathering. I'm just forgetting the words again. I feel like we've explained this on one of our past videos, but we'll go through it quickly. Yeah. Chemical it's essentially when either salt or some other um, chemical that is in the water, sometimes um, uh, the, uh, calcium, uh, the 
Carbon. Carbon, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, carbon from the atmosphere gets soaked into the water, water becomes more acidic, and the water can basically dissolve away um, the calcium carbonate structures that the, uh, that the reefs have, have formed as an exoskeleton. Excellent, that was very succinct. Um, the last type of um, you erosion. The, you enjoy the fish? It's my favourite. I'm gonna, I'll give them a close up. It's okay. parrotfish. So, parrotfish are these cool fish and they have beaks, basically. <laughs> They've got these really hard mouths and they actually bite the coral. So they, mm, they, I'm reading they the coral. Bite the coral, but in biting the coral, they also bite away bits of the limestone. Um, and we call these bioeroders. Bio because they're living, eroders because they erode right. the limestone coral. And if you go snorkeling, and if you came with us to go by a reef and went snorkeling, you can hear it. Like you go underwater and you can hear the like crunching like, of the parrot. Really, it's, it's a very pronounced sound. Yeah. So what the hell is that? Like I taught this topic obviously for a while, and I told students like, oh, when you go snorkeling, you can hear it. It wasn't until um, we went snorkeling up the Great Barrier Reef that I was like, whoa, like you can you can really hear it. Yeah, it's like this. Like it's, it's almost faint. It's, it's like, like it's almost this popcorn crunching yeah. kind of sound. It's, it's bizarre. Just, it's constant because there's all these clownfish everywhere just snacking on the reef. It's crazy. Did you say clownfish? Uh, clownfish. <laughs> um, and what does that get turned into? Uh, it gets turned into sand. They yeah. spit it out and it turns into sand. So a lot of the sand that you walk on, um, poop it out. yeah, or poop it out. Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of the the beaches um, you'll find around the, in in the reef are very. The sand is very white and very coarse. It feels like you walk too much and just bare feet. It almost mm. feels very abrasive on your on your feet. Um, it's because of this a lot of it is cloud. Uh, I keep going parrot to say fish parrot fish. Have have um, chewed up the coral and, and squeezed it. Squeezed, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you if you look at the coral, uh, if you look at sand around a reef under a microscope, you can see it's just tiny little bits of coral. And all these coral things. So Again, cool. go to YouTube and type in parrotfish sand, something like that. Yeah. There's there's really great videos yeah. of it. And um, um, Google and sand. Um, sand under a microscope too. Oh yeah, that's cool. Way way more interesting than it sounds. Just to say. Yeah, I saw a really good one of the virus recently, and, the, and it like actually looks like it's like a living strategy. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. Mm, very good. Cool. So there are agents of erosion. Our main agent of erosion in the Great Barrier Reef is water, mm -hmm. because they are submerged in water mm -hmm. all the time. Um, mechanical weathering, Definitely chemical weathering, weathering and bioeroders. They're yeah. the three agents. No, for some reason, everyone always remembers the parrot fish and the bioeroders. Um, and bioeroders. I think is a really cool word to add in there, so wow. I like that. Fire road is, sounds like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like some sort of cartoon character. Enjoy. We're going to be back at you with, I guess, what's part three, looking at the hydrologic mm, processes. Yeah, sub, sub dot point three of this second dot There's point. There's lots of priorities. subs. Lots of sub dot point. This is cool. the sub of a sub, to sub be honest, because they're like together. We're going deep. It's, oh, it's like Inception. It's Geoception. Thanks, guys. Bye.